Hello, everyone. Welcome to DMV II Live for October 28th, 2017. Keep in mind, stocks and strategies discussed here are for information only. Do not treat any information provided here as investment advice or recommendation. It is up to the individual investor to perform due diligence prior to investing in any company. And here are the symbols covered this week. Feel free to pause the video and look up the symbols to learn more about the underlying businesses. Phone trend, thousand dollar telephones coming. That would have been or the computer, big, or the the computer. I mean, it's incredible. So I think one of the, I personally think one of the big trends that's going to come in the future, especially with all the baby boomers, are self driving cars. I really do. I have a client who, about three years ago, bought a hundred and thirty-five thousand uh, dollar Cadillac coupe. It has nine cameras mounted on it, and uh, his parents left him a house down in the Carolinas, and he lives here in Arlington. Actually, he told me he just puts it on the road and on three ninety-five, and it goes straight down to the exit. Now you have to turn off the road with this car, but he told me he sits there and he eats and he plays crossword puzzles and. He told me, and I told him, a lot of people are really concerned about the safeties of these cars. I know people who say they won't even get in one; they're scared to death of it. They want to drive their own car. But he told me, if you really rode in one of these cars, he said the way these cameras are mounted, it looks two cars in advance. The minute the second car in advance slows down two or three miles an hour, he said the brake is applied on that Cadillac so quickly a human could never respond that quickly. He feels they're actually safer. And you know, I think I sometimes think children being born right today will never know what it is to drive their own car because I think in twenty or twenty-five years, as these cars, and I think they're going to develop them fast. I mean, when I say fast, over a twenty-year period, not over ten to fifteen, twenty years to get one of these level five cars that completely drives itself. I think in about ten, you know, five to ten years, it'll be a level four car. But I think that.、Um, I, I just think that that the this is the way it's going to be. So I was looking up some of these companies that really, you know, they have Waymo and one one、uh, stock that I think has some interest in self driving cars is the Chinese、uh, Google B A I D U. I think it is. I don't know what the、uh, symbol is though. B A I D U. B I D U. B I D U. Because.、Uh, The Wall Street Journal had a big article on BIDU, and you know, I just think it's going to be, you know, seeing which of these companies comes forward. I actually、yeah. think in twenty-five years, if you want to drive your own car, you can, but you'll have very high insurance premiums because they'll say you're the one who will cause the accidents as a human on the road, as opposed to this automated technology. Which, I mean, I'm sure there are going to be people killed. I'm sure there are going to be crashes along the way. I'm sure there are going to be problems, but. I honestly think these self-driving cars are going to be a, and I think it's going to change a lot of things. Like if you say, "Well, I want to go to uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota," you just get in your car, program Rochester, Minnesota, and I think the seats will lay back. You can just lay down on the way there. Probably people will stop to eat, but people will also have places they can stop to shower. Also, I think it'll affect the hotel industry to some extent, the train industry, the airline industry. I, I mean, I just think I don't know. I just think self-driving cars are going to have some ramifications. It's probably hard to see what a lot of them are, but I think with the baby boomers aging and a lot of people getting into their seventies and eighties in the next ten, twenty years, it would give a lot of independence to people who probably wouldn't have that ability. I don't know. That's my idea. And this this stock, I think, went down. It had this little drop recently. And I'm not that familiar with it, but I know the Wall Street Journal wrote up about it this yeah, week. Yeah, they gap down on. And they had their earnings announcement. That was、uh, the earnings, days, yeah. Yeah, two days ago. Did you, did you buy the stock on the straw? I didn't buy it at all. I'm just—it's just one of the stocks that I think they also are involved in these self-driving cars, and they are supposedly the Google of China. Then, of course, there's the Google of Russia too, that some people are interested in. And they're—they're they're also heavily in the in the AI also. Yeah, and this、uh, artificial intelligence—I、yeah. think, like I said, I think it is the future. I think they're going to be keep things. Keep your eye on Nvidia then too, because they're in both、yeah. the self-driving car and the AI space. They've taken off huge. No one I've talked about for. Months. It's awesome. And Nvidia. I'm gonna look it up. Nvidia. Thank you.、Yeah. And the and the other Chinese company that's invested in self-driving is、uh, Tencent.、Uh, they made a、uh, they bought a ten percent of、uh, Tesla Motors or、uh, Tesla. Has Tesla come out 
with any recent proclamations about their intention for self-driving? I know they have this auto. -pilot. Yeah, it's already equipped, but yeah. Are they gonna do that? Is that a big push for them? I don't know. Uh, Elon Musk has been pretty uh, quiet on that. <laughs> Is that it for me, Marie? That's it for me, yes. The gentleman here? Hi. Um, I think it was like two or three months ago, I think back in August, I uh, talked about this company, Al Cobra, ADHD, <laughs> the ADHD. ADHD? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> remarkably, it's a pharmaceutical company that was actually looking into ADHD. Like they were trying to oh. develop a product oh. for wow. ADHD. So when I talked about it, I think it was mid August, um, the company was down to oh, like a dollar to a share. <laughs> and it was trading um, at a significant discount to its book value. So they had like $47 million in cash. And there were the market capitalization was about 26 million. They had no debt. There were activists involved. Barrage Capital came in. They were doing some stuff. Basically, were saying that they were going to try and figure out a way to unlock the value of the uh, investment. So, in September, they actually did announce a merger with this other pharmaceutical company called Arcturus, and it didn't do much when they first announced it. Was it in September? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Partly because it was a reverse IPO, they were actually, Arcturus is a private company and they were merging into the public company. So it didn't really have, uh, there was no cash that shareholders of Alcobra were gonna get immediately. But on, you can see where that big jump is, uh, there was an announcement that Arcturus had a partnership or was announcing a partnership with Johnson & Johnson. And it jumped up to, yeah, almost 220 during that time. Um, so I'm pointing this out because when I when I pitched it, I was saying that this this is an investment, it's a value investment where it's trading at a significant discount to its book value. There's a, there's a high margin of safety. And that just to get back to book value, which was $1.47, was roughly like a 44% um, appreciation. Now, when I bought in, uh, like in August, dollar two, dollar four, um, and I sold out on the day that it popped up, um, right around that dollar eighties. Well, hey, okay, great, you know, and a great trade. Yeah, the, the the annualized return on investment was something like three hundred and seventy percent. It was like that was seventy percent, just just an actual, but an annualized it was three hundred. Yeah, it was just a short period of time. Um, because I was only in the position for like seven days. Um, but I'm bringing it up because I'm one of the few value investors here. One of the, well, at least that's my interpretation of it. Um, this is an example of, of, of one of those types of pieces of working out where it wasn't about the chart. It was about the, the fundamental research the, uh, about the company, what the cash was, the, company, the, the capital structure of the company, and external things that were going on, like this activist investors, Ross Capital coming in, reading the filings, reading the news, and, and keeping up with the company in that way, which was what enabled the history. Um, so I just wanted to share that back because I haven't been here since it happened. Oh, okay. Just uh, wanted to share that with people. Sure. I mean, that's what you think. That's what we want to know is what you think. How did you find it in the first place? Uh, hunting around for companies that were trading below book value. Screening. Just screening, yeah. And then I was just went through a bunch of them and would read filings and read, just get, get a basic sense of the company. And this one was unique in that it was all cash. All cash and no debt, and it was a failed pharmaceutical. They had just failed their lab, their most recent clinical trials, mm -hmm. so they had no product line anymore. So they weren't burning <laughs> cash. Well, they were burning cash, but they weren't burning a lot because these activists came in, they cut operating expenses, and they said we need to do something different. Um, most failed pharmaceuticals, this does not happen because most right. failed pharmaceuticals don't give up; they right. keep going. Yeah. But because these activists came in and and basically forced a bunch of change. That was that was part of what it was for me, was once I noticed that there were activists involved, I started reading about them, started trying to understand what they had done and what they were trying to accomplish, and they had been pretty much doing everything that they had said they were going to do. They cut operating expenses by half in like two months. Um, and even if 
the company continued to exist, I think they were only burning like a million a quarter. So they had some time to burn through 47 million if that was what was going to happen. And my my take on it was it happened down a significant margin of safety. It was already trading at a huge discount to just the cash value of the company, let alone the, the IP of the products that they work on. Because the research had some value on what they spent. I think, I think it was 60 million on research in the past four years. But the, the valuation that I was looking at didn't value that at all. It was just the cash. So there was a potential upside of the, the intellectual property, which they're still that that could play into this still because they're they're actually talking about selling the IP out. And I don't know what that's gonna be valued at. I'm not a pharmaceutical expert, but so. do, do you have any updates on uh, Unity? Yeah, I'm Unity is a fun one too. Uh, <laughs> Unity, uh, U N I T, like unit. This guy slammed over the past month over a bunch of different, so I pitched it probably like somewhere August, September, and then it took another like 20%. Yeah, well, that's a dive. hefty, hefty pay, 13.8%. Yeah, you lost like 16% just. Yeah, it's, it's been a fun one to watch. So it's very, it's, it's tied to Windstream, uh, which is a telecom that spun off Unity as basically a fiber real estate investment trust. Um, and because when Windstream is 70% of the revenue of the unit, they're like, if you pull up Wind's chart, you'll see they're, they're pretty much trading in, in sympathy with each other. Um, and part of what I was saying last time when I, when I talked about it is that that's not a good way to look. They do have a tight relationship, but unity is not. It is not being fairly valued because of its relationship with Wind, and there's a speculation that Windstream can go bankrupt. And the speculation is, is that if Windstream goes bankrupt, then Unity is going to have significant financial challenges, which I don't think is true. Um, and I won't get into all of that. But basically, what's happened over the past uh, month or so is that there were—I uh, don't remember the name of the group of investors, but they bought a bunch of. Windstream's debt and tried to claim, but basically claim default on uh, Windstream because of a breach of covenant of debt. So then Windstream took like a 10% dive and then Unity took a dive because of that. And it's just been one thing after the other that's been going on. And I think it got down to like $14, which was a like 15% yield. Um, but it's coming back up. And I think we'll see the, once they announce uh, earnings, both Windstream and Unity, I think we'll see a pop back up in both of them, unless there's something else going on. But the stuff that was impacting them, uh, Unity, I don't think is actually relevant to the valuation. Because if Windstream goes bankrupt, there's a long kind of, there's, there's history that suggests that because Unity is a creditor, not a a creditor to, to Windstream, that the likelihood of them not paying out their rent to them is, is low. Um, and if you actually read the legal documents, it's, it does, I don't even know how it makes sense to, to do it that way. Yeah. But that's the argument, essentially, is that when Windstream goes bankrupt, Unity is going to lose all the, the revenue yeah. from their rent. Because I remember reading that uh, Unity takes about 70 something percent of the revenue from Windstream, and then they had this like triple lease agreement with them. And if you, uh, Windstream <coughs> lost, then that lease will need to be restructured. But you believe that the customers of Windstream will continue and work to restructure that? Yeah, because because Windstream relies on the fiber of Unity to actually give people the internet. Yeah. Windstream as a company is insoluble without Unity, without the lease that they have for the fiber. They can't continue business operations without the fiber. So it's not in Windstream's interest to not pay the rent. It might get, get negotiated down a little bit, but the, that likelihood is also small. And, and it would only happen in, in the case that was of interest to both of them. So, so could you talk about the valuation side, like in yeah. terms of like, you know, what the assets do they want, like in a fiber, like in a hundred miles do they want, what kind of, it's a three billion dollar company right now. Yeah. yeah, I can, but I have to pull it up again. That's fine, we can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about it. All right. So is that it then for you? Yeah. Michael, you're next. Um, 
lots of training around the fang stocks last week, but let me just share a point of view on Elon Musk, something as we were talking about earlier. Elon Musk, in addition to making cars and space, he the whole family is very, very uh, very smart and strategic. And as you some of you may know, one of his brothers uh, is involved in food production, farm to table and those kinds of things. But aside from that, Elon Musk is since the disaster in Puerto Rico is doing something quietly without the press and without making big claims. If that is successful, what he's trying to do in Puerto Rico, it may even become one of the Tesla like giant things. As you know, he's interested in energy storage. He has actually, uh, without any financial incentives, taken over a couple of hospitals in Puerto Rico where there was no power and completely just took about the size of half of a parking lot and put solar cells there and saying, even if you never get power, that should be enough for you to operate. So he's going through this where it, large enterprises, he wants to see if they can collect enough energy, actually run a large operation uh, without any dependence, any dependence on the power company. Because the reason for that is if there's an interest in in following that line of thinking is that storage of energy, solar and energy, is where the difficulty is and there's politics and regulations that come in. And for example, in California, uh, there's a law that they passed and they said during the day when solar cells are producing energy and you have too much, you can give it back. Edison Power has to buy back the energy from you. And then when the sun is no longer there, you need energy, Edison Power gives energy back to you. So that's their real story. So there's a lot of politics and stuff involved in it. Elon Musk and his gang, very smart folks, have always hated that idea that we're depending on bureaucrats to let us do this. There are a lot of storage technologies available like salt, uh, cement blocks, uh, heat up the water during the day and use it at night. Australia and many of the countries in the world, Portugal is very, very interested in that. They've been working on storage energy, what is water, cement blocks, salt, or whatever. Elon is interested in storing energy during the day to charge up his batteries. Never mind the rest of the stuff. So batteries can charge, be charged enough during the day to last through the night and maybe a few more hours during the day, you even have the whole package. Getting energy, storing it, and then coming back the next day. So Puerto Rico, he is very successfully running two hospitals right now, completely off of the grid. Just nothing, grid has nothing to do with it. Grid is not even there. Even though FEMA and, and all that, the clinical transformers there, provide them with power, but they are not even too interested because Elon is giving them the power. So if that is successful, <laughs> like my own phone. <laughs> if Elon is, is successful in this completing the cycle, that the energy during the day, storing it successfully enough, to use it when there's no sun, and then starting the cycle again, that could revolutionize the world, really. Well, it's pretty sunny. And Puerto Rico, but is that going to work in Yorkshire? Well, um, you see the combination that would put. See, here, here's the idea. I, I, will, I will add to that too, Michael. Puerto Rico is unique in that the, the utility down there is horrible. I mean, like 30 cents an hour for kilowatt, and they're losing money because it's so packed with political hacks. I mean, they're, they don't know how to do anything. That's the old when you lost your election, you wound up at the utility company just you know, putting down a paycheck. And that just costs like skyrocketed. So, if, so in Puerto Rico, if you can get off that, so you don't have to pay it. They don't have to hook your wires up. You know, you're not going to pay them a dime. You can get everything yourself. That is a real right edge right right that gives them. If you're going to do a successful experiment for that, Puerto Rico is probably that's the perfect place spot for it. To answer your question, that's where the technology and storage comes in. For example, you wouldn't go to Norway. Uh, to uh, take your solar cells and see if it works. What they're doing is that 
where there's not that much sun, two things are happening. One, it makes the batteries not just last eight hours, but eight days. That, plus direct sunshine. Somebody here was talking about it, and was quite curious about it. They're saying, solar cell is like a reflector, gets the, the sun energy and converts into DC, and then DC can be changed changing DAC. Now they're working on material that doesn't even need direct sun. As long as it's sunny someplace and clouds and stuff are fine, as long as it's getting heat energy, even if it's not directly from the sun, that's enough to charge the batteries that will last longer and longer and longer. So that's the way they resolve that. So it's not a universal solution, but if south of the equator would be solve the problem, north can take care of it by itself. They're just dividing the thing to go into sections where this can be done and be profitable and not done and not be profitable and it's okay. But anyways, just a little side note on Tesla and Elon Musk, what they're doing. Yeah. You're talking long term. Short term, this is gonna go down. I'll tell you what. <laughs> no, Tesla. I'm, a, I'm a chartist, okay? I'm just looking at, at the it's behavior of the stock. Sure. Here's a big here's a big drop on high volume with two gaps. Here we have a head and shoulders pattern, which has been violated at this point. My feeling is the stock's going to go down about here. That's short term. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with the reality. Okay. <laughs> charts up and down. All I know is I'm not going to buy charts it right do, now. No, charts, <laughs> charts do not know what Elon Musk is thinking. Charts, they do not know. Charts re reflects the psychology History. of the market right now, but they it has not psychology. <laughs> so that. That chart doesn't tell you anything about what the fundamentals are and how emotional people are. Look at that guy, my guy, a couple of people. The stock would go to zero, they would still be invested in. The stock has been in a bear market down 20% on five different occasions in, in two years, which is pretty remarkable. <laughs> but don't you think this one is. How, how well it's actually done. Don't you think this, this has some fundamental basis in that the rollout of the Model 3 was like it's. Terrible. The production issues are obscure, but seem to be big. I'm not. I'm not I mean, I'm not. I have no view, no position on it. But I'm just saying that this this may not be just a chart action. No, but this is not nothing to do with the fundamentals. Yeah, fundamentals are Model Musk, Three. Elon Musk said no. Tiffany Elon Musk said stock price does not reflect what I have. Stock price reflects what I plan to have. So if those who believe what he's planning to do pay that much money, they're not playing for a Tesla. This is a case where you have to think more than just charts up and down. This is, you're not paying for Tesla. You're not paying for factories. You're not paying for batteries. You're playing for what this guy's up to do. I have nothing to do with that. Tesla, I'm not defending it. I'm simply saying this chart does not account for the market dynamics and what his plans are and what is how he's operating the batteries and using the home as an experiment just like he's using hospital for a repo, test out the batteries to see if he can change the world. I'd say That's I don't different. look at a stock from a philosophical standpoint. I'm in it for the money. I'm not. I'm, I'm in it for the money. I mean, you could be, but I'm, I'm not. I'm in it for the money. money. Everybody's got their own within way a year of or two. I'm, I'm in it for the money within a year or two. Philosophy does not interest me when it comes to my money going out to buy something. You, you're not a candidate for this stuff. Right. This right. stuff's not for you. Then. It's someone else. <laughs> <laughs> it's someone else. I always talk about that someone else, not you. But, but it's true though. What Jake says is true because sometimes when you cut... I'm not interested in a social message. I'm interested yeah. in making money. You may not be. I want to make money <laughs> within the next couple of years. Anyway, enough for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's your dime. I'm going to leave. Well, the point I have to make... I'm going to say that. In this business, with not being able... This was a this is a really big issue, not being able, this is why people, the oil people, and are always saying, oh, solar won't work because you can't store it. So this storage now the issue story. is a really big issue. If this, if they ever perfect that, it's going to change the wealth of we the We almost did. The oil what, boys can slide did. down a hill with yeah. their oil. Elon Musk, his family, owns that technology because they have the approach. Right now, they're spending Tesla's money to see if for 24 hour a day, I can add a location like Puerto Rico, I can get 
rid of the power company and separate the hospital from well, it. Well, that really works. So That's where he's I'd at. I'd say it's going to be a really He's big doing something that mankind has never seen. He told a province in province or whatever they are in Australia, I will deliver this $50 billion company to you, charge you nothing if it doesn't work. Ford and GM and a lot of other value thing companies cannot do that. He has personal interest in making a difference. I'm not interested in Tesla. I have nothing to do with it. I'm simply saying there's a thought process, all of you should know something about it. I'm done. <laughs> all right, Jay, you're next. We're all... <laughs> well, I, I have nothing, uh, nothing, nothing very interesting. I just, I just, as money comes in, I continue to invest in uh, three broad indexes uh, because I have no ability to really to pick stocks at these levels. And as, as long as the macro, um, intermediate macro situation looks good, which it does, I'm going to just keep doing it. You do very well. <laughs> I mean, that's what we want. We want to know what you say. Back and getting rich, like, like you, <laughs> yeah, like, like most people are doing. Yeah. So you're into like the ETF, basically. Just three. The VTI that's four thousand US. VXUS that's six thousand of foreign firms, and the VWO, which is a, oh, I know, which is emerging. Okay, that's all Vanguard funds. VWO. What was the other one? VTI. VXUS and VTI. VXUS and VTI. By the way, I didn't want to make a, a, a commercial. If anybody has the Vanguard mutual funds, the actually there are uh, like six of them there, the Treasury, Securities and all that, they have a vote they have to cast, and this has to be run. And please go ahead and, and make sure you do cast your vote, whatever it may be, because if you don't, if they don't have enough votes, and those mutual funds, the um, Treasury mutual funds, I think, and a few others, I think, might have been, and they will have to do another uh, annual meeting, which is going to cost more money for the for Vanguard. So I just that's a quick plug. All right. So is that it? Okay, okay. Question for Jay: Why so who's uh, S and P five hundred? So that's kind of you don't find that redundant with the VTI. It's it's, it's, mo it's most it's mostly redundant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Either either one is fine. It's most it mostly redundant. Yeah, actually, yes, because it's weighted, <laughs> because of the weighting, it is mostly yeah. redundant. I just prefer to okay. have the big one. VTI yeah. has what more than his five. VTI has more than five. What? He said three. Yeah. It's VWO, VXUS, VTI. What? Yeah. What is VWO? VWO, VXUS, VTI. No, what is that? So VWO is an emerging. Oh, okay. Well, I'm totally. VXUS is the whole world except for the US. Okay. And you can really make it simple. There's a, there's one of them, I forget what the symbol is, that has all the stocks, basically all the stocks in the world. In the world. I mean, I mean, I mean not every single one, but all the ones that trade with it, market cap or whatever. Yeah, it's you fun. can you yeah. can make. I it wonder if that's good. underperformed though. Probably. Yeah, I, I, well, I, well, international has underperformed U.S. Yeah. since 2011, except for this year, and these trends usually last a while. So that's why VWO and VXUS there's overlap, of course. But I don't mind that because I prefer to be a little bit weighted towards international maps because. Underperformed. So long. Usually, you get reversion to the mean on these things. It takes years, though. And and the valuations are are uh, better. Than they're a little bit. Yeah, their valuations are yeah, still a little bit better. Is. Yes, they are better, considerably better, actually. So you look out for macro and geopolitical risks, but not to the micro scale. <coughs> well, I look at micro, and I, I, I I'm not smart enough to pick stocks like you guys at these levels. This I like I like pick I like picking I like picking stocks when everything is you know right, yeah. down the tubes <laughs> and then you, you you then then I you know the Warren Buffett statement I like to jump over one foot hurdles that's what I like to do to me these hurdles are ten feet I mean you know I like your choices I I don't think I could find those picks. Low hanging fruit. I like low hanging fruit, and really nothing's low hanging, but low. but but you know I don't want to be out of the market now. Uh, I heard you. So. All right. So is that it for you, Jay? Yes. Rick, you're next. Yesterday morning, I was looking at my holdings, and 
Las Vegas Sands, LVS, was getting beaten up pretty badly. I looked for news, and it, there didn't seem to be any particular news to account for. Well, I'll have one new bit for you. Apparently, their competition, Steve Wynn, is kind of connected with the Pubas over there in China because he did pass a note to Trump saying, hey, this, there's a guy in the U.S. that the Chinese don't like, the bosses don't like over there. He's a criminal. And Trump said, hey, he's a criminal. Let's get him out of here in the U.S. So Wynn has, is connected over the Chinese people with the bosses, and maybe uh, Vegas Sands isn't. I mean, that, that would be my guess. That's the problem. They're not connected like Wynn is. But, and that might be well, crazy. anyway, um, it's King Trump's fault. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, you get out there in China, you, like need, this. you need to be connected. Yeah. I thought, well, maybe I can make something with this. So I put in a limit order, and I do love limit orders. So okay. um, I put in a limit order for $61 even. Okay. Not really thinking that I would be likely to get it, but what the hell. Sure enough, sometime right. in the afternoon, and my boat came in, and I got. All right. I doubled my position at sixty-one even. Okay. However, um, taking all the shares I own into account, I'm about even right now on Las Vegas Sands. But I'm I'm glad I did that. At least yeah. temporarily, I feel smart. All right. Well, that's always a good feeling, and. Uh, it does have a beefy yield here, I see, 4.6%. Yeah. All right, so is that it for your Rick? Yes, it is. All right, Noel, you're next. Okay. All right, I'm going to have a couple stocks for you, but let me show this back in February. This is ACN. ACN, if people are familiar with the stock, this is an insurance company. It's a Century. Century Insurance. A. C. As for CAC. A. C. N. Right. Okay. Accenture, yeah. yeah. Accenture's insurance company? No. Uh, no. Oh, they're, 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 they're like a yeah. consulting yeah. firm. Yeah. It's, 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 it's right. consulting. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Because right. I have another insurance company. Where did you get it? Where did I get the stock? Where? The price. What price? In February, uh, when I purchased oh, it, but I only wow. got like a little less than 60 shares, not too much. February, so, oh, wow, that's down in this area. What's the yeah, smart guy. Right. Well, yeah. Um, considering I'm mixing this company up with an insurance stock, and like, I'm going to hold off. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I got this one mixed up with something else. Oh, well, that happens. Uh, it's an interesting but, chart, though. Yeah, this is a, I presented this back in February. John and I talked about it a few times. Uh, this is one of my favorites. But again, I'm going to hold off on this one. Okay. And give you two more tickets. How about that, Jim? All right. That I've already researched and have a lot on. Okay. Now, this is the key to this is the key to one of my strategies that I've been using for stocks. It's going for small companies with CEOs who have a small payroll. Now, why would you want to do that? If your CEO is not greedy, and you're a small company around five billion or so, it shows that there's potential growth in not just the size of the company, but also the fact that you got a hungry CEO who wants to get a bonus. So here's a couple of ideas for that. Uh, this is a company called ANSS. ANSS is um, ANSYS, ANSYS, I hope I spelled that right, or pronounced that right. Um, just got into this stock. Uh, ANSYS, huh? Yeah, I didn't really go heavy in the suspected of stock, but the, uh, the, most of the analysts are talking that this is a hold for now, which means that this is a great time for an entry, believe it or not. Because I know you, Vince is looking at uh, hit the 52 week high, but it's still a great entry point because of the fact that stocks that hit 52 week highs, ladies and gentlemen, they hit it for a reason, which means that you don't look every day at a stock that hits a 52 week high. Uh, you don't go heavy at a stock at the top, but you do throw a little bit, a little skin in the game. You wait for a micro pullback, you throw a little more skin in the game. You just play the stock. I mean, you know, I guess it looks a little better. You know, each one's a little bit higher. Yeah, well, we we, we, we hope it has support above 130. And that's, I mean, it looks like it, it does have that uh, projection. But what I want to talk about is the company itself. The company 
it deals with uh, uh, markets and engineering simulation software, which is very important because most of the thing, everything is going into the cloud. Everything is being designed and simulated on computers. They also deal with uh, defense and automotive industry, uh, industrial equipment, electronics, biomedical energy and materials, and chemical processing. So they have their hands in a lot of different things. So because they're diversified, is another reason why it's been on my radar. They don't really respond, as you can see the volatility in the stock. I mean, anyone can look at that. Short candlesticks means that there's not a lot of volatility. There's been a few, you know, corrections. I would call those corrections. I don't know very much about those corrections. But you can see by the candlesticks, the fact that they're so thin means that their internet trading is not a lot. So this is a stock that's that your ground up and buy because it's, it's pretty stable. You're not going to lose too yeah, much. And this, this is not a candlestick chart, but I think it has to be guess what it's like. No, that would be a candlestick. Well, aren't those candlesticks nice? Well, you need to have, well, if it's up, I, I it's... You don't call it a candlestick. It's... They're bars. They're bars. They're bars. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 oh, white and they're up and black and they're down. Yeah, it's similar. <laughs> yeah, it's similar. It's a similar way of visualizing it. That's yeah, well, you know, that's a regular bar chart as opposed to a candlestick, which has the color change. Yeah, the tick at the top. I don't remember the bars. Bars, the tick at the top is the high or the close. The tick at the lower is the low at the close. Yeah, and then the shadow. Yeah, the, the shadow or be clear. The, the length of the stick itself is the movement. So it's similar to a candlestick. So that longer bars mean more about so it's good. Yeah, well that's So anyway, this is a great stock. Um, that's my first recommendation. I have another recommendation. Okay. I've never heard of this one, so yeah. Yeah, this is good. Uh, another mid-sized company recommendation for people that are interested in stocks that are reliable. Again, this is a stick ticker uh, B R K R. This is a this is listed on the NASDAQ. This came through some of the communication that I have. E-R-K-A. K-R-K-R, yeah. Sorry about that. E-R-K-R. E-R-K-R. What I don't like about this, again, this is again following the same train of thought that CEOs are not getting paydays, are more hungry, able to drive the company and get that payday. A CEO in this case, he makes only six hundred thousand dollars. So much of the other uh, company I presented is around six to eight hundred thousand dollars. And in this case, this company manufactures scientific instruments, analytical and uh, diagnostic yeah, solutions. Very little yield. Yeah. Does it say Baker or what's it? Baker. Yeah. Uh, they're a, they're a uh, Massachusetts-based company. Uh, they definitely have. Uh, their hands in a diverse set of technologies. Um, some of their, they do manufacturers of life sciences, which is interesting to me because I, it's hard to really get a, a company that's working in the field of life sciences. Uh, but again, if you look at this chart, I mean, this is a really reliable pattern for investment. Uh, at this point, I would say, I wouldn't be as bullish as the previous stock I would say wait for a small pullback. But again, you're dealing with a strike price that you can easily get in with 100 shares. And it won't mess you, it won't ruin your day. Uh, but if I was to do that, I would wait for Monday to see if there's any, any interday activity. Probably after uh, 10 to the clock, put 100, hours, excuse me, 100 shares in, see what it does for you. I think it's a great stock, it's a great growth stock. And so a lot of people say that everything's so expensive. That's why I researched these gentleman in the room to tell you that you can always find a deal and I think this is a great stop. One foot hurdle. Yeah. And that's well, just, actually let me because uh, no, no, no. I wanted to met, comment on ANSYS which actually for me was a one foot hurdle. Yeah. I bought it originally in 2002. Oh okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah at the time it was uh, like 10 times better or something like okay. that. Uh, it's one of my all-time best. Uh, I have Peeled off little pieces of it over the years. They've always been mistaken sales. It's a great company. I will say this though: it's about forty-five times earnings and about thirty-five times projected next year. Wow! It's not cheap. Wow! Not cheap. But hey, it's a bull market. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
All right. <laughs> so is that a door in all? Jay. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> but, I, but, but, but I like to hold, but I have a good eye to hold, okay? That's only, Sandals what's that, 15 years? Yeah. That's short for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Jay thinks differently here. Excellent. So is that a door in all? Let me show you something. I put the 16-day moving average in here. That was a blue line. Stocks like this, they're low beta stocks. In other words, they move in tight channels, okay? And I have found that with the low beta stocks that are trading, say, half a million shares a day or more, the 16-day moving average is something special. Oh, well. Look down here. As the 16-day moving average turned around, you could buy it. Here it turns around going the other way, you could sell it. Here it turns around going the other way, you could buy it again. There are certain stocks that have certain characteristics where, to me, the 16-day moving average is something special. Yeah. And this, this would have worked beautifully. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a nice All right. Uh, Look at the 16-day, is that something DC does? Or you, is that no, this is just something I discovered. 16 day. Not 15, not 17, 16. 16. <laughs> and I don't know why. Oh, I'll check it out. It makes it's, sense. I'm curious enough. It makes oh, sense. Yes. It makes sense because the moving average essentially is delaying the actual curve. Because if you just plot, if you forget a moving average, just get the same plot of the actual data and right. shift it a little bit, you see that. Cross yeah, but this too. doesn't work but for any kind of stock. 16. It's got to be a stock that's low beta, okay, and it's got to have a price above ten dollars a share, mm -hmm. and usually below fifty dollars a share, and it's it's got to have like 500,000 shares per day on average trading. And the 16 MA works real well for that particular category of stocks. It, it goes right back to essentially uh, yeah. some, how yeah, I discovered this works. just fooling around one day. Like you got a different I frequency. A lot, you got a lot of different stocks, so. and it works. Because every once in a while it doesn't work. <laughs> right. And, and in the case where it doesn't work, you got to bail out fast. All right, uh, Don, I guess you're next here. Ah, uh, so I did some tax loss selling, which is you can time. dump my dogs. Uh, first one was G-I-M. Dump the dogs, that's a, that's a good phrase. G-I-M, uh, oh, okay, that's it. A closed end phone. Fun. Yeah. 16 MA does not work here. Notice that, all the little jiggles. <laughs> yeah, that's a closed end fund, and uh, you know, they're a different breed of cat there. And NTG. That might be a closed end fund, too. I don't know how you want to these things. That's an MLP. And finally, PSEC. Uh, yeah, that's famous for their uh, <coughs> structure there. Yeah. Wow. I'm glad I got a lot of dividends off of those three because they kind of made it break even. I bought VIG for the money. <coughs> v as a dog? V as in Victor. Victor. I G V. Yeah. That would probably do better. Yeah, that's the 2% yield, so you're getting something from them. And that's it for me. Okay. All right, uh, Gobi, you're next. Yeah. Um, so the company that I'm interested in, okay, which one is? Uh, it's an MLP, it's PBFX. So <coughs> what these guys do is that there's a parent called PBF Energy. I probably talked to you a few months ago. So the, they are refiners, and they distributed yeah. or carved out of the, the assets, like basically the storage terminals and the distribution and pipelines. And how they make money is basically they, they make fixed dollar a month. They have no correlation with, like, you know, Oil goes okay. up and down, they have no reflection on the revenue or cash flow. The PBF Energy owns 40% of the company. Basically, as a parent, they own the, the master uh, a unit still. 
and they have they have a market cap of about 800 million. They make about EBIT 155 million, and they are very very capital expenditure light company. Yeah. And why now? Uh, that's an interesting part. Um, how many people know Carlos? Oh, yeah. yeah, he's the, so he's the he's richest the guy. Well, he's guy, guy in Mexico. Mexico. He, he runs like American Mobile. And they recently purchased 5% of this company and the parent, which is PBF, which I do know not. So um, these guys are billionaires. They are not, they can, they're not going to buy 5% of the company. They don't think the company is worthwhile to, to buy it and hold it. The company is very, very attractively priced relative to the cash flow, as you can see in the, the dividend yield. Dividend yield is actually covered like 135%, which means 1.35 times coverage. And they have an expectation of having 1.15 to 1.2 times coverage. And there are lots of opportunities to reinvest the cash when they raise money through, basically through the debt offerings over time. That's the predominant way of like, you know, having an MLP. And while you hold it, like, you, know, you, don't, you don't pay tax on it and the distributions uh, becomes large enough. It's, it's a very, very interesting opportunity if you're if you're into that kind of opportunity. Is that dividend reliable? I said 135 percent coverage ratio, so they don't have to have that much. They only pay 90 percent of the operating profit, and over time, actually, this dividend coverage is going to get higher and higher. Okay. And if, you, if you're interested, you can, you can research for that part. So is that it, Gobi? That's it, yes. Hey, James is in the back. Yeah, do you want to do the, the, the under the table there? Uh, oh, you okay. mean, all right, well, okay, okay Vince, I, I think James would like you to do a little bit from the lady there. Okay. Katie, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so I had a couple of things this week. I got in on, um, it was an IPO uh, that I Fat. mentioned last week, uh, Fat, F-A-T, and that had a Nice little jump the first day was like 11.6%. Uh, I personally did not um, bail on it in time. And so like it was a swing and a miss, um, although I still hold uh, the shares. So it's, you know, to be determined, you know, where, where the stock goes from here. Um, there was an opportunity, but uh, anyway, I didn't, didn't seize the day on that. Uh, I did, um, however, buy some Barclays. Um, Barclays went down something like 9%. And I see that as a steady, um, a worthwhile company that I don't think is going anywhere anytime soon. And so, is that BCS? Correct. Okay. So I think hopefully that. Well, it did <coughs> some, it went up two percent since since I bought. Was there news that prompted that fall? Well, there was a, a lawsuit um, about some kind of copper. Um, Trading or, or um, securities that you really can't articulate it, but there there was a lawsuit, and then there was also um, there's also like I guess Barclays is is stepping it's into some real. more um, tricky like like um, risky strategies and how they're managing their money or, or um, loans and that kind of thing. So that those were the two articles that I read. But again, I did well. I didn't go to in depth, I just kind of saw the nine percent, and like that just really got, got my, yeah. my flag up. So I'm like, okay, get that. So uh, that was about the extent of my um, activity this week. Did you get out of Roku? I got out of Roku. Yeah, it was a one day turnaround. Oh, well, good. Yeah. Mid Oh, uh, yeah. Hundred percent to hundred percent. It was eighteen to twenty eight. My bad. Yeah. I need to follow you. Okay. Right. So is that it then, Brian? That's all for me. All right now we're back to you, James. Uh, actually, no news or action this week. I just think the market's irrational and too high, so I'm kind of sitting still for now. Yeah. Uh, are you are you still following your pets? I remember you talked about pets. Yeah, I, and... I'm following them, but I never acted. On oh, okay. Yeah, you, you exploded. Uh, I think last week or something. Yeah, it, yeah. Went, it was going down for a while, and then it really took off. I was surprised by it as well. Do you know what that was about? Or? No, I okay. haven't seen the detail. I was like, oh, I remember. It was, like, <laughs> yeah. there was pet, someone, someone oh, mentioned about it. And was, then uh, I looked it up, I was like, what happened? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was at the same meeting, I was following Weight Watchers too, and I think Weight Watchers had a better reaction, but pets came back this week. Yeah. 
so that's it for me. Go ahead, Sahib. All right, um, Sahib. Nothing from my side, actually. Uh, but the only thing I did is I reduced my position in Tesla. Uh, but other than that, the still thing is as good. Okay. Um, James again? Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I just um, nibbled on a couple of stocks, just very small. Um, you don't need to pull them all up, but one was RY Royal Bank, uh, the other was uh, WPC, and the third was Waste Management. And I bought the Waste Management because I was here and someone was talking about it, and then it pulled back. So I just bought some. So he was, he was kind of saying that. He, it had dipped and he had lost some money. I was like, okay, it's a good time for me to buy some. Um, Probably. Was it? Two percent you know. So I figure, like, I have a um, a little portfolio, and I, I try to buy companies that have like a three to five percent dividend yield, and it, it's for my Roth. So I'm trying to get, to, say, a sturdy thirty companies, so it's very diversified. So. There's no major risk to any one particular company. Um, how about Microsoft this last week? Um, I, I smell a stock split coming uh, fairly soon. Um, you heard it here first, yeah. yeah I, I can just smell it because I've looked at their stock split history and it's like they're getting to the range where that's gonna happen. Um, and I'll just tell you that I think this is the beginning of a trend for the next couple of years with Microsoft. Um, and I'll just say real quickly, two segments I'm staying away from are um, the consumer staples and uh, telecoms. Like every couple of weeks now, I always say something negatively about AT&T. And um, I really think that um, this is a company that might struggle over the next couple of years. I, I think AT&T might be the next GE. That's just my fault. I own them both, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well they're, not, they're not making more cash flow. So they have to pay this giant dividend. And I'm not a big believer in the, in the in their purchase that they're trying to make right now. It's I think it's sort of like a football team where you, they're trying to think like how we can grow in the future. And this day and age with funding <laughs> and the way the market's going, I think they might be buying something old. I mean, no one's doing this big bundle anymore. They're just going out and buying a Netflix if they want to watch TV. Not the NFL package and all, the whole suite, people are trying to save money. So I just think that, and I think with direct TV, I think they're losing money on every direct TV subscriber. So it's, would you believe, if you didn't already know, the $35 package that AT&T is offering to direct TV now, their cost is $31. Mm. Wow. I thought, yeah. I, I thought I heard it wrong, but I checked it. $31 is what you have to pay to give it to you for $35. But remember, long term, you cannot watch Netflix without AT&T. Well, I mean, I don't need I don't need AT&T because T-Mobile's giving me unlimited data for less than the cost of AT&T service. So um, going forward, like I was sitting next to someone in the airplane, like they didn't even have cell phone services. They can just connect to your phone. Mm -hmm. They don't even need service. So, Things are going to change over the next couple of years. I just don't know if these big companies like AT and T are quick enough and agile enough um, to, to handle these changes. Some of like GE, I, I question whether they've been managed properly over the last couple of years. But just you know, AT and T is not AT and T. AT and T is really an old regional bell. Right. Look where they have come from. And some of you would know right. well, where they have come from to where they are. I just, I just, when you think of tech and you think of innovation, you do not think telecom at all yeah. anymore. I'm I mean, trying to defend my thought. Just my thought on the matter. So it didn't work right. I'm not going to say that they can't change. <laughs> I I'm know. just saying that to me, I just, I, if you're looking for a dividend grower, AT&T like increases their dividend like a penny a year or two pennies a year. Um, so even though they have a 5 or 6% dividend, it's not going anywhere right now. Also, their payout ratio is very effective. I, I've been researching at and because it, it's a little tempting, but I I have decided I'm not buying it, but, well, for the time being, anyway. And part of the reason is they're paying out something like 90 plus percent. Yeah, 5.8% <clears throat> yield. <coughs> yeah, that's... 
and it, it bounces around, so it could go back up too. But I just think long term, I'm a, I'm a little bit hesitant to get into a company like this, just just because of the yield. One more data point: uh, Retor came out last night that AT and T is going to miss the boat on the Apple iPhone X because they're not bundling like competitors. So that's another strike. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. So is that it for you, James? That's it for me. Uh, next gentleman there. I forget your name. Uh, well, I've got uh, three three companies. The first one, uh, it's actually a private company, but there's a reason I'm bringing it up. Um, I was curious, has anybody ever heard of this software tool called Adaptive Insights? Anybody use it or heard of it? Um, might want to look into it. It's a really, really cool software tool that uh, it's cloud-based and it integrates with Excel. And essentially what it does is that it's basically made for people who work in financial planning uh, and forecasting. So when you're in meetings and CFOs are saying, well, what would EBITDA look like if we tr if we trimmed operating expenses by 20% or what would revenue look like if we increased bookings? Instead of going into your Excel and Excel can be kind of a clunky tool, you can do all of it in this, this tool called Adaptive Insights and it uh, updates simultaneously uh, with your models so you can see what the new forecast looks like versus your old forecast in real time. And what's also cool is it's linked to PowerPoint and Word. So if you have like outputs on PowerPoint and then you change your model in adaptive, the PowerPoint slide will also update. So it's, it's really cool. I took a demo of the product and, and I mean, to me, it's the real deal. They've raised about 170 million from Premier. I'm talking like Premier venture capital firms out in the Valley. And um, they had a seminar last week, and I went and, and I um, actually spoke with their CFO for a while. And he told me that they just closed on venture debt. And that's interesting to me because, uh, you know, venture debt is, if anybody's not familiar with that vehicle, it's still a loan. It's like raising money from a bank, but it has a very high coupon rate because it's uh, mostly for companies that are, are venture capital backed, but they're still not profitable. Um, so instead of paying like 3% interest, you're paying like 9 or 10%. Um, Just a question on that, Ben Sites. Yeah. You saw the software? Yeah, I did. Are you in finance? I am. You on the selling side or valuation side? More valuation side, but I have never. Uh, I'm not a customer. That's why I want. I want. To yeah, because like I would say that you're saying that you can adjust your projection. That's almost like when it'll be looking directly in the yeah. cell and changing it. Where you don't have to use it that way. There, there's other things it can do, yeah. um, but it, 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 to, to me, I, I I was sort of skeptical. Like, why is this different than Excel? Like, why is it better? Um, I think it's more the just amount of things that you can do at the same time, as opposed to like adjusting this formula on this tab, this formula on that tab, all sorts of things like that. But there, there are other things you can do once you actually map your model. Because what, what you do is you dump your model into their software. So it's mapped, you know, using the same formulas. Um, so venture debt typically is the last Money to come into a company um, before an IPO. So I, I was talking with their CFO, and they just eclipsed 100 million in revenue. And for a recurring revenue software business, that's a, a, a huge, huge milestone. And um, use it as a, a service, right? Yeah. And he um, he did allude to that they they probably will be gearing up for an IPO at some point. Um, and you know, in, in a yeah, my guess is that they're not profitable yet, which is why they <coughs> raised some high yield debt. But I think that should they file an S1 in the next year to 18 months, it, it may be a company worth checking out. Um, because I, I do think that if their numbers are as good as some of the other SaaS players out there, it'll trade at a pretty healthy revenue multiple. Um, it might be more of a trade than an investment. Um, I also think it could be a potential M&A target for Salesforce or even a Microsoft that may want to integrate that, that technology. And I, I did ask the CFO and I knew he probably wasn't going to be able to give me a straight answer, but I, I asked if Microsoft had ever come in and tried to scoop the thing up and he, he said no, um, not to his knowledge, but he is relatively new because what I will say is they made the right investments. This Their currency CFO has only been there a couple of years. They have a new head of sales. Um, 
that they hired from Salesforce. So I think that not only have they made investments, but they've made the right investments. It seems like the management team is the real deal. What makes this different than in Microsoft or, or, or Tableau? Tableau? So Tableau is more, to my knowledge, uh, data visualization, whereas this is more for forecasting and budget to actual variance analysis. This is more for like FPA professionals. So this has built-in algorithms. It does, versus Tableau, which is more of a visualization tool for BI analysts. Yep. Um, but to, you know, I, I think it's cool. I think it's worth checking out. I'd love to know what the real numbers are. And should they file an S one, it, it 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 could end up being a you know a decent little little company. Um, and then the the two tickers that I, I want to check out. I haven't bought either of these companies, but the first one it's this Team T E A N, and every time I. Uh, they have earnings. I think okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for this to pull back, and then it's T E A M like team, like a team. T E A M. Okay. And and then they end up smashing earnings, and the thing goes through the roof. So I've totally like missed out on it so many times. I was just curious if we could look at the chart and see what the group thinks. If they think there's any room for this to, to keep going, or oh, uh, gap up here. <coughs> High volume. You know, if if it's worth waiting for a pullback or. If you just pull the trigger. I, I really don't know what to do, but a, a, another cool it's thing. It's a about British outfit, is Can that you right? Say the name of the company. It's it's Altasian. Um, it's a, it's a software company and Salesforce. Like Atlas. 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 Yeah. Atlas. 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 Free. So I'm not sure. I besides using it, I don't know anything about the company. So huh. yeah, I, the only other thing yeah, I know is I think Salesforce it. invested in them when they were private, and uh, the very Salesforce thing to do is to buy the company after it goes public. They, they've done that before, um, so it could be a potential M and A target. But it's only IPO like a year and a half ago, so I don't think they'd get taken over anytime soon. Um, and then the other company is Dover Corporation, D-O-V. Okay. I don't know if anybody, I, again, I, I didn't buy it. I was considering buying it. Um, okay, that's it. They make elevators, don't they? Yeah, they do a lot of kind of manufacturing and right. There's a big gap there down for some reason, and then three dollars. Well, so it, the, yeah, there was some news last week that, that Dan Loeb's hedge fund had bought like a five percent stake, so it, it bumped up maybe five to six points, and then I think you know some people started selling because it was you know it was just so high um, that they wanted to cash out. So it's kind of plateaued, but that that news broke maybe like ten days ago. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody knows this company. It was just it came on my radar. I didn't know if anybody else had anything worth on it. Well, it's, it's you know it's an industrial conglomerate that's been around for a long time, very well run, well managed. Over the years, I don't I don't follow it closely, but you know, like like there's it's, it's pretty expensive. It's about twenty five times earnings for a slow growth, so. you know, old industry kind of uh, business. All right, so is that it for you? Yeah. Okay, the gentleman over there. Sorry, okay. right, just got to pass. Okay, Dan, you're next. Uh, I bought a little bit of store, S-T-O-R. It was a slight pull bag. What, were, what was your thinking on that? Well, yeah, I just like the uh, like the business model. Decent <coughs> uh, you know, uh, ever since it was on my radar, ever since uh, uh, it's a read, huh? Five percent yield, yes. so well, you know, beefy yield. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it. I do want actually uh, bring it up. Wondering if there, 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 uh, there's <coughs> another read, Tanger. I think it's S K N. Tanger. Yeah, yeah, it's a Tanger real. Hey, pull back. You know, I'm interested in it. I just wondered if anybody had any comments on it. They're a big uh, outlets. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I was kind of against it until I, I was out. SKT. 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 Yeah. I went. S yeah. SDK. Okay. Until SKT. I was, yeah. It's a couple weeks ago. SKT. Oh, right. Stop keeping. 
couple of weeks ago, I was out in, near Asheville, and so they have a big place there, and it was packed. <coughs> so it kind of made me re interested in it. I haven't bought it, but uh, I don't know if anybody has any experience. Five point six percent real. Uh, it's, I see it's kind of dumb yeah. here, just a right. right. And you bought the stuff? I did not. Okay. But I, but I, I mentioned that <laughs> I've been, I've been watching it. I think Nelson mentioned this too. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Nelson likes it. But and um, again, you know, I just, I drove by one the other week out in North Carolina, and it was the parking lot was packed, and because uh, I didn't think they were doing that kind of business, but I could be wrong. People go there and take a walk. Why Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that you, you're, if any of these types of plays right now, it's like you got to come down on where you think retail is going to be in 10 years, essentially. Like, if you think retail is going to be continuing to grow in the next 10 years, then this would be fine. And in fact, it would probably be a good play because a lot of these um, these mall REITs are, their valuations are really low right, right. now. But yeah. Like personally, I've looked at a lot of these, and I just don't. I don't know, so I'm not willing to jump in on them. Yeah. So, and to me, there's other opportunities out there that I don't have to. I don't have to come down on the question of where I think retail is going to be in ten years. Right. So, a lot of population. But I I know the company. A lot of you go there just like you made an observation from the street. There's one in next to the end here. Go there. Next to where? Uh, oh, yeah. National Harbor. Oh, okay. In that area. And I go there a lot, and so I'm oh. more interested in that. And uh, lots of people there. They look at each and every store, the Boston Company of mine, can they stay open? And it's just that kind of thing. Yeah. So a lot of interest, they are actually competing, openly competing with the mall space. They're saying, people don't want to be closed in the building, we are open door, we are everywhere, that kind of stuff. Right. But as far as what you said, retail industry has changed so much. Yeah. That I would be careful, unless justifying myself and my own behavior, unless you're like Macy's, which I own some of that, mm -hmm. you have a brand name, branding, there's a price built <coughs> into it. You just like Sears, you stop selling stuff and just sell your real estate, you will do okay. Macy's, so unless, they don't have the brand right yet that Macy does. Sure, so if right. you want to win something, they won't. Yeah. yeah. Buy XRT or something like that, but I would not play with an individual like that. I would just say that maybe it hasn't bottomed yet, but this retail space isn't going away. It will be, I think, eventually. You say that they're struggling retailers, it'll be repurposed for something else. Right, but they need to pivot and they're not. So or above the mall, they're, they're, yeah. they're not. Macy's and Sears are on a downward spiral because they need to go into the Amazon space and they're not going to. But but the property owners, for example, um, in New York City, uh, uh, if I say the name of Lauren Taylor's, just sold their building, their main building on Saks Fifth Avenue, or wherever it is, to a company called WeWork. They're mm -hmm. the largest like, yeah. office space owner. It, so this, these spaces are going to be used. You go to some malls now, you don't see a storefront. There's a giant auto body shop in the strip mall. So they repurpose the space. And they get the weak tenants out, and then the rents are going to go up. It's just a matter of when to buy. Right, right. Well, I mean, I think this is different than say Macy's yeah, because right. they seem to focus their air, their locations, their tourist place, right. people have time and disposable income. Uh, but if you're, but thank you for the suggestions. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. We'll see. Yeah, or they could do something like what Tesla does. Like they have a store in the mall, right. but they don't sell cars there. They yeah, just they're you know, see things, they, they advertise, that's what the... Even the clothing sports. space, Bonobos, doesn't yeah. sell clothes in the store. Exactly. It's a show place. You order it. Yep. Yep. That's the new model. Yep. You don't have to have inventory. So, money. so people who want to try things on, they can still physically yeah. go and try it and still order online. <laughs> Even from the same store, method, repurpose and reallocation like the malls are doing, Matter of the new trend in, and I buy a lot of appliances and stuff for homes. You go to places like Lowe's or Home Depot, it's a company. Anything you put your finger on, I'm going to buy this microwave, this and that, they don't have it, order online. So that is just a, mm -hmm. just like Tesla. All these gadgets are there, you can touch and feel, but if you want to buy it, 
Yeah. Well, whatever it's here is the It's a showroom, yeah. yeah. Showroom. Mm -hmm. So they are doing that now. So whoever does it, whether it's Tesla, Home Depot, or whatever, will be successful. The rest of them, Lord knows what. But for investment purposes, if you're really interested in retail, buy XRT. Otherwise, I wouldn't look at it. My, just sort of percent. Yeah, in a few more years, you don't even need that. You will no, have no, VR no. headsets and then you just view yeah. in well, the right. VR. <laughs> <laughs> that too. So is that it for you, Dan? That's it, thanks. My well, lady there. Hi. Okay. I don't really do much, but I just, um, I bought back home just a few, you know, when they went in the deep. And I don't really know because they keep on saying that they have a lawsuit with Apple or whatever. So I don't really know if I should hold them for one. So if you can give me any thoughts. Well, for long-term view, I really like this company just because, um, they essentially dominate the communication uh, hardware or chips industry. And most of the devices, even the Chinese phones and the US phones and uh, Korean phones, they're pretty much all using their proprietary technology. And that's what makes them have that ability to price their uh, uh, essential royalties that way. And uh, I think Apple is just that throwing a you know, fist up because they're there. Yeah, I mean, you got to pay for what you, you know, if you value that much, you got to pay for what you want, right? You can't just cheap out. Um, so for the long term, I mean, the company's technology is there. Underlying business is still, nothing's changed. The only difference is that some customer is pissed because they feel like they're overcharging and they don't use it. So that's my philosophy. It's like the company's sound. Nothing's changed. Business still there. You, you say the moment. That's, that's it. <laughs> So is that it for you? Yeah. Sam, you're next. Good now. Oh, uh, and and is that your wife or no? no. Oh. <laughs> oh okay. You met my wife before. I did, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so beautiful. I'm like, oh, it's so great. So so I don't think so <laughs> no, no, I actually saw that. I was basically getting point like getting knowledge. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, that's all the all the things. Okay. okay. Well, I guess that's it. Uh, open up to everybody. For yeah. About drinks. Well, I have no idea. What about Gary? Gary? Yeah. All right. Anybody wants Gary? Oh, okay. yeah. I get promised the, on the email out there the one stock that the that um, the gal the uh, I was impressed by the gal. She still she still is together after all these years. That's her. Uh, what's her name? I. Uh, Susie Orman? What? It's not Susie Orman you're talking about. No, no, no. The one I sent you, that was a, she was a, a oh, Spanish I, I maid. Gone her, uh, mm -hmm. Consuelo Mac. Consuelo Mac. That, well, she, she was forced out because she was too old for the Wall Street Journal. They had Martina Bartomolo took over because she was too old. She was pushed out. But I thought she still looks good. <laughs> that was my opinion. However, the interview that she had with this bookstabber, who was you know, really quite an expert uh, investor, he recommended this particular mutual fund. As a matter of fact, he said this was the one. He thought for a long-term investor, he says India will eventually get it together. And the Matthews people you know, do know their stuff about India. He says, if you're going to go with just one really long term investment, he recommended Mindex. <coughs> That's, you know, you can see that from the interview from the, uh, on the website. Okay. Mindex, is there a ticket? Uh, it's yeah, M I D N D X. It's a mutual fund. <coughs> All right. And this concludes this week's live stream. Thank you for listening.